Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. This Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Evan Sayet, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, Evan Say it. He's a comedian, he's a writer, he's a lecturer, and I guess my co-host, who used to be my commander back in Bosnia, Eric Kleinsmith, who's joining me, I guess you guys met Eric at one of his speeches. Can you give us some background on how, how and why you got connected with Evan? Actually, I met Evan by doing a, a, a cold email based upon one of the talks that he had given, and I was in the middle of doing a lot of tra- training development for the Army on intelligence analysis and analytical techniques, and using going through one of uh, one of his talks uh, and again it was a i think it was one at the for the heritage uh, foundation and uh Evan was giving a talk about uh, being able to understand a, a a politically liberal mindset but he did it in a way that it, it could uh, i could uh, immediately bells and whistles would went off in my mind about how what he was talking about could actually be set to a model for analysis, a predictive model, so that if you knew the type, and, and really it spawned is if you knew the type of ideology that was, you know, a, a lens that helped someone focus on things that went on in the world, everything that you saw that lens through, if you use that ideology strictly, could therefore be predicted. So I reached out to Evan, and I think it was just a straight cold email to get in touch with them, just say, hey, you got, got some stuff uh, that you're interested in, see if you want to talk about it. And, and we've been friends ever since. And Pete, I, I certainly remember the email extremely well. I had just given this speech to the Heritage Foundation, and it was actually my first national speech. You know, I, I'd been a television writer and a, a television producer and a stand-up comedian. My first foray into serious Washington politics, and this speech just went beyond viral. It went so far beyond viral that at a certain point, National Review Online posted a bulletin that said, this talk by Evan Sayet, and they linked to it, this talk by Evan Sayet is cramming our inboxes. Please stop sending it. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so at that point, I'm getting many, 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 many emails, and I and get one, a cold one from some guy named Eric Kleinsmith, and I recognize the name. I don't know how I recognize the name, but I know just it's I know the name from somewhere. Basically, it said best analysis I've ever come across. Congratulations, Eric Klein. So I Google him. And at that point, I believe his title was um, a head of intelligence training for Lockheed Martin. And I say, OK, wow, that's pretty impressive. The head of intelligence of Lockheed Martin thinks mine is the best analysis he's ever come across. But I don't know his name from 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 that. So I, I Googled just a, a little deeper. And I remember I had seen him testify in front of Congress about a computer program called Able Danger, which, as I understand it, you guys, please don't laugh at me because my my depth of knowledge in this field is is not the deepest, it's not the greatest, but that was one of, if not the first uh, computer programs to as deeply in a fairly commonplace marketplace. And Eric, here's a good opportunity in a moment for for you to promote your book but about how this, this data mining worked. So now the fact that the guy who, who helped create that program thinks my analysis is the best he's ever come across and is, is pretty, I'm flying pretty high off of that. And then Eric asked me if it's all right if he and his team use my speech, use, use the elements of my speech to create a model as he just described. And, and so within just several weeks or maybe, maybe a month or two at the most, this one-time stand-up comedian, late night writer, has a computer model based on his analysis. <laughs> At that point, some of the other emails I, I was getting repeatedly, different people independently kept using the same odd phrase. They kept saying to me, do you know what you got there? You've got the unified field theory of liberalism. Once people understand what you said in that speech, they understand everything about why so many good, smart, decent, generous people, people like relatives of mine, people like certainly my colleagues in Hollywood, why it is they reject fact and reason and invariably side with wrong. And so when I had an opportunity to turn this into a book, I actually did 
do it in a semi-scientific way. I offered four laws and three corollaries. And, and that became my book, The Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks. Interesting. Boy, that is that is fascinating. So I don't know if you realize this or not, but Eric and I, you know, both worked in the Intel side. Eric, I would say that you became more of like an, an analysis guy. Maybe because he could pronounce it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. He's an analyst, right? He puts the puzzle together. And I'm more of a field guy where I go out and bring him puzzle pieces from any puzzle. And somehow... Guys like Eric take this whole bag of puzzle pieces that I bring and they figure out what puzzle they go to and if they connect to other things. So it's crazy. When I sit in a room, and I don't know, I'm asking Eric, when I sit in a room and I'm, I'm hearing someone talk or whatever, I'm thinking about their placement and access. That's kind of how my brain works. Like, what is this, who does this person know? What information do they have access to? And would they be good for my show? You know, because let's not talk in terms of combat. But Eric, do you not turn your your intel brain off ever either hey this is p day turner from the break it down show checking in real quick to ask you this john scott and i all support save the brave with our time our location our effort and our money each month we give a small amount do the same with us go to save the brave.org click on the donate tab pick an amount that you want to come out each month and they will handle all the rest i stand behind these folks thank you so much let's get back to the show when i sit in the room and I don't know, I'm asking Eric, when I sit in a room and I'm, I'm hearing someone talk or whatever, I'm thinking about their placement and access. That's kind of how my brain works. Like, what is this, who does this person know? What information do they have access to? And would they be good for my show? Or, you know, because let's not talk in terms of combat. But Eric, do you not turn your, your intel brain off ever either? No. In fact, you know, this is why the Evans, again, Evans piece interested me. I mean, so it's, you know, when, when you're, you know, I did most of my time in Intel at tactical level. So for, you know, and, and the Intel officer for an infantry battalion and then, and then for an armor brigade and then moving over to do the company when we were together as a company command time in the Balkans. But, it, you know, all through that time, you're doing different types of analysis. And so when I hear something from Evan and I was already hip deep in, in doing, you know, the, the development of training and things like that. So I've seen so many other methods or so many other case you can even call it a case study um or or simple anecdotal reference I, and i even had i've even had anec folks from different universities come up to me while i was at lockheed and said hey i really did this great paper on oh gosh one was like on the armenian genocide of, of 1919 or i got did one on this uh, mujahideen uh, in, within the balkans and i said you know that that's fantastic but unless you can model it you, whatever you're talking about unless you can turn it into a model that can be recreated i cannot use it as a methodology and and you know it's, it's if it's a one time shot that you did fantastic great assessment and everything else but until you can give me the formula and the math and the process behind it I cannot recreate it, therefore I cannot teach it and I cannot train it. And if I may, it's truly to both about Eric, quite frankly, the fact that if Eric had used what you had said earlier, who is this guy and what is his access? Well, at that point I was nobody and I had none. I was a comedian, I was a, a television writer. I certainly wasn't a think tankian. I certainly didn't have access to, to stores of information and evidence either a scholar or a politician. So had that been the criterion by which Eric had, had made his choice as to uh, the validity of my arguments, it would have been miscomplete. Yeah, well, I'm here to tell you that we're listening for, you know, the perfect person who's on the inside, sure, great, but we're looking for something we can work with, you know? And if he hears a model that makes sense in his, uh, his crazy analyst brain, then uh, it doesn't really matter at that point. Like he's got something he wants to work with. Let me ask you this. And so as you get this letter, what other kind of crazy offers did you get or emails did you get? You got this guy who's uh, this uh, international combat spy, a master. Uh, what else did you get in the email box? I can't believe you're really asking me if that wasn't enough or if there was more. <laughs> no, I, I think the top intelligence analyst wanting to model a, a, a computer model after my analysis was probably the... The, the tip top. I mean, certainly I got uh, publishing offers and everybody. I think one of the, the most things to happen to me during this run is I've always been a big Dennis Miller fan and he had just gotten his own radio show at this time. So I tune in on day one and he's talking about me. He's talking about me in the speech. 
All right, so I tune in to day two, and his guest is David Horowitz, and they're talking about me. And on day three of his show, the entire hour was, a, was the guest. Huh. Well, that's something. Yeah, it's, it's really mind-blowing how that talk, again, when I arrived in Washington to give that talk, there was nobody in Washington who, who knew me, and certainly I had none of the bona fides to, to be lecturing at the Heritage Foundation. In fact, that was even, even sort of a, a, an accident of miscommunication. And yet in this town where everybody gives speeches every day, where everybody writes articles every day, where everybody's reading two, three, four, five different books every day, the fact that this talk was able to, to come out of that, that, that ether, come out of that and become the phenomenon that did is really quite striking. Yeah, sometimes it's just a noise factory, honestly. And to, to hear something, and that's the thing is, to hear something that allows you to trick, you know, like like Evan said, everybody's, you, you got folks that are coming out with books all the time. And a lot of them are anecdotals that I call them the, the I was there books. <laughs> and, and, and again, what, great. But then all of a sudden, it's this talk that Evan gave and the way he logically built up how to understand a, 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 a liberal mindset. Now, again, if you, if you turn it into a model, then it has to be able to use for any type of mindset, whether it's a conservative mindset, right. whether it's libertarian, whether it's it, based upon socialism, based capitalism, doesn't matter. But the thing is, is the way he laid it out, you could do that. And so, and that's why I say, it's like, look, I, under, I mean, I, I, I understand uh, uh, politically, I, I'm conservative as well, but if I can't use this, uh, and, and model myself, honestly, and my own thought process, and it doesn't work, but it did. And that's why, and, and when you look at the stuff that he's written, and he followed up with a book and this talk, that becomes almost like a Rosetta Stone to be able to understand all the rest of the noise that comes out of the political sphere uh, every day. Okay, I just want you guys, and maybe this goes up as my next quote, but Eric Kleinsmith that just compared my work to the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> Just, just saying, just saying. <laughs> either one, either the program or the actual stone itself. Exactly. You can all check out Evan Say It on Twitter at Evan Say It or on Facebook at Evan Say It, S-A-Y-E-T, Evan Say It. His book is called Apocalypse Now. It's like apocalypse and California mixed together, so it's clever. <laughs> Actually, what it is, it's my fake plural of apocalypse. Oh, okay. And what I find humorous about this, and I, I don't know if you were throwing to commercial or whatnot, because my ear buttons fell out for a moment. But so you tell me to shut up or not. But it's a compendium in humorous fashion and rhyme illustrated by the great editorial cartoonist A.F. <laughs> Bronco. So it's really a humor book. And in fact, it was the number one new release in political humor for four weeks in a row on Amazon. But it's also meant for children. It lays out all of the environmental apocalypses, or in my humorous turn of a phrase, apocali, that they've threatened us with since, since I was a child, you know, back in, in the 1970s. And it's, and it's a way to leave children's tension and fear about the latest apocalypse, global warming or, the, or, or, or climate change or climate crisis, whatever it's called today. What, what I find humorous about the title is it's impossible to have more than one apocalypse. Yes. Right? If, if, if they were right <laughs> even once in the last 60 years, there wouldn't have been, you know, the next one. Yeah. Yeah. I still remember, Evan, at eight or nine years old, yes. that just being absolutely scared to be Jesus about that. We thought the ozone layer was, was going to fry us all because it was good because we were using aerosol spray cans. Right. And, and this, my, and this my 1974. The, yep. And the one that terrified me was killer bees. Yes. What a horrible, killer way, bees. I was, <laughs> what a horrible way I was going to die. <laughs> oh yeah. My God. I skipped that one. <laughs> yeah. No, the, I remember the killer bees were terrible. Here in California, they were coming up. They were getting closer and closer all the time. It was like this uh, horrible specter that was coming in. As, as I recall, we only had 12 years to live. That's right. <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> Apparently, that's the mental model that we can all bear when it comes to some kind of a, a, an apocalypse. Well, that's, that's the problem though, with, with doomsday scenarios and, and the end is nigh and uh, the world's going to end tomorrow. Or actually, that's just... Uh called to mind that ABC horror movie, The Day After Tomorrow, which was about the nuclear apocalypse. When you say the world's going to end tomorrow, you have to change your threat the very next day. True. Let's talk a little bit about your model, because 
I um I am neither right nor left. I, I say this all the time. I have things about people me that would make me not a good fit for either party. So I, I'm I'm just sort of happily floating along, trying to make the middle a little more normal for everybody. So give me an idea of what you've come up with in terms of analyzing the liberal mind. Okay. First of all, uh, a little bit about nomenclature and uh, and 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 wording and whatnot. Liberal. When I describe liberal, when I speak about liberal. It's the reason I actually call them the modern liberal, the modifier meant to make clear. We're not talking lowercase l. We're not talking your father's, your grandfather's liberalism. In fact, I probably should have, and if I had the chance to redo it, would have just called them leftists. And just to put in perspective my own take, I'm a New York City born, lowercase l, liberal Jew. My lifelong support to, to a certain point for the Democratic Party was basically what Andrew Breitbart would call the de facto setting for somebody born into my demographic. You, you know, I was sort of thoughtful. I, I certainly wasn't a leftist. I certainly didn't read Chairman Mao's little book and, and uh, Marx's manifesto, Das Kapital, and say, yes, this is what I believe. It, it was just growing up when I grew up, life was pretty easy for everybody who was an American. I, by the time I came of age, Things that human beings worried about and suffered through since the dawn of time had been vanquished from this earth. All right. Disease, there was no disease in America, which smallpox vanquished, chickenpox vanquished, polio vanquished, the flu, which had just recently, as far as historic time goes, wiped out a third of a continent, was now a three day paid vacation. Uh, <laughs> Right, hunger in America, maybe in Biafra, which doesn't even exist any longer. Maybe well, you know, someplace far away still existed. But by the time I came of age, if you found it in the street, you could eat a full three-course meal, going to a ninety cent only or dollar store and buying a TV dinner. Hunger, poverty, poverty was so non-existent as it had been understood anywhere and everywhere else in the history of the world. You know, the, the streets of Calcutta was not what poverty meant in America. It meant you only had basic cable. It meant you only had one car. It meant, right. right? So growing up, you didn't really have to think about what you believed because the casualties and, 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 and the consequences of being wrong were not really that great for the first time, literally since the Garden, well, if you, if you believe literally in the Garden of Eden, which is why my book is called The Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks. So my politics, I, I voted Democrat for forever. Because I knew what all Democrats know. I knew that Democrats are good and Republicans are evil. I'm good. I vote Democrat. You know, I knew Democrats like peace. Republicans like war. I like peace. I must be a Democrat. Dem Democrats like the air. Republicans hate air. I like air. I must be a Democrat. And for me, all that changed post 9-11. And it wasn't 9-11 that changed because to be honest with you, 9-11 didn't surprise me. Obviously, I didn't know the date. I didn't know the targets. The, 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 the carnage stunned me and sickened me. But even as a brain-dead liberal, I knew just enough about the world to know that the same people who were murdering the Jews of Israel for no other reason than that they were the closest infidels, and they were murdering Hindus in India for no other reason than they were the closest infidels, and who were, had just murdered children in Beslan, Russia. No other reason they were the closest infidels would when they could figure out a way across those giant oceans coming to the big infidel, the great Satan. Of course they would. What changed me and, and, and began me to, to think was the response of the left to the terrorist attacks, the idea that we deserved them, that they were the chickens coming home to roost, that we had provoked them, and that the way to prevent further attacks was to be nicer to the terrorists. This just made no sense to me. To see, weren't liberals supposed to hate religious fanaticism? And yet they were taking the side of the most fanatically, religiously fanatic people and, and, and act against the most secular liberal of cities, New York City. And this made no sense to me. And, and I had to begin to, to think. And Pete, I have an expression. The first time you think is the last time you're a Democrat. <laughs> That's hilarious. And, <laughs> so once I began to think and, and say, this seems in contradiction to what, lib what I understood liberalism to be, 
I began to look at other issues that I had simply taken for granted, taken the, 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 the leftist teachings, you know, the, the Vietnam War was a war of aggression. And I began to recognize this pattern. So here's what, what it is. There are four laws and three corollaries as, as it's written in the book. For our purposes and for our time frame, I'm just going to give you the first two. Each time, I'm just, the first two laws. Each time I'm going to give it to you first, how it's written in the book, and then I'll explain all right. All right. So the first law of the unified field theory of liberalism is that the modern liberal, that's anybody born after World War II, for reasons explained in the book, and getting worse with each successive generation as the last of the great generations died off, and the first of that generation began to become the powers that be in the universities and elsewhere. The modern liberal was raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. In the 1980s, by no coincidence, when the first babies born after World War II, who became the children of the 60s, who became the powers that be in the 1980s, in the 1980s, thinking was outlawed. Right? It was deemed by the left to be a hate crime. Huh. And the outlaw of, think of thinking is this. Anything you believe, Pete, anything Eric believes, anything I believe, anything your listeners believe, anything anybody believes, is going to have been so tainted by our personal prejudices. Prejudices we all have, we can't help but have as human beings. Prejudices based on such things as the color of your skin, the nation of ancestry, your height, your weight, your sex, and so on. Anything that a person believes is going to have been so tainted by their personal bigotries that the only way not to be a bigot is to never think at all. But now, that would lead somebody to, to if, if there was only the first law, that would lead people to expect the modern liberal to sometimes be right, sometimes be wrong, and sometimes fall somewhere in the middle. But the modern liberal is not only always wrong, he is always as wrong as wrong can be. Every single one of his convictions and arguments and policy prescriptions are diametrically opposed to what is good, true, and beneficial. Let's give you one example uh, nationally and one example internationally. How does somebody look at what went down in, in Ferguson, Missouri? And people in the know, people at ABC and CBS News and the New York Times and within the government, how do you decide that this gentle giant, this sweet, innocent young black child was gunned down in cold blood by yet another evil white racist cop while Michael Brown was pleading for his life with his hands in the air yelling, don't shoot? How do you get it so absolutely wrong as to be 180 degrees from right? How do you look at the Middle East with this tiny liberal democracy, lowercase letters all, of Israel, with its uh, woman prime minister back in the 60s, with its gay pride parades, with so much liberalism and, and, and freedom of religion that their enemy, the, the, the Islamicists, hold the place of pride, the Dome of the Mount, above the, 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 the holiest of Jewish sites, the Western Wall. How do you look at nations surrounded by the most, Islam, by the most uh, homophobic, and xenophobic and, and misogynistic and, and guys, I think even a little bit anti-Semitic Muslim world and decide that not only is the problem the Jews, but of all the bad peoples in the world, the Jews are the only ones who need to be economically strangled to death through, through boycott, divestment and sanctions. How do they get it so wrong? And it, it, by the way, in the subsequent speech, I, I made the argument that I made, forgive me, as, as well as I make any arguments, that the mainstream media, because of this ideology, has gotten literally every major story of the last 60 years, not just wrong, but diametrically opposed to right. And in every single instance, their mischaracterizations aided and abetted the forces of evil, failure, and wrong, and denigrated and weakened the forces of good, right, and successful. So not to get too far off track, but for example, the Tet Offensive was reported as a back-breaking defeat for the forces of liberty, when in reality it was a war-ending defeat for the forces of oppression. Right? You look at the, they said in the 1980s that, that the Japanese economy was an unstoppable economic juggernaut, when in reality it was plummeting into what is now a decades-long recession. Right? It doesn't, at the beginning of the Gulf War, they said that, that our, our, our forces were in a quagmire. When in reality, three weeks later, when they arrived in Baghdad, it was the culmination of the swiftest military victory of its kind in all of human history. 
It doesn't matter what the issue is. The modern liberal will invariably side with evil, failure, and wrong, and against what's good, right, and successful. And the reason for that is, is the second law of the unified field theory of liberalism. Again, I'll give it to you as it's in the book, and then I'll explain. Indiscriminateness of thought does not lead to indiscriminateness of convictions. Indiscriminateness of thought leads invariably and inevitably to split evil over good, wrong over right, ugly over beautiful, profane over profound, and failure over success. Why? Because if no culture, no religion, no form of governance, no familial construct, no behavior, no work of art, if nothing is better than anything else, then success is unjust. Why should a person, a culture, a religion, a nation, why, why should it succeed if it's not better than any other? And just the flip side of that is failure as proved by nothing other than the fact that it has failed is proof positive that somehow the failure must have been victimized. After all, why should a person, a nation, a culture, a religion, why should it fail if it's not worse than any other? Therefore, simply by extension, if, if success and failure is proof positive of injustice, then great success and great failures prove positive of great injustice. And when you get the kind of long and sustained success of, of the Jews, both as, as a culture over all of time, the longest surviving culture in all of human history, and then as, as, as a reconstitution nation of Israel, or you look at America, the longest surviving democracy and the most prosperous and successful and powerful nation in the history of the world, exceptional success is proof positive of exceptional injustice, which is why they will now use whatever intellect that they have not to, to ask themselves, is America really exceptional or are the Jews really exceptional? And is there something to their culture and their behaviors that have led to the success? They're not allowed to do that because indiscriminateness is a moral imperative. Wow. Do you need more? <laughs> yes, I want more. <laughs> Keep going. No, that, no. Well, but the same thing is true of good and evil. If nothing is allowed to be recognized as good or evil, then that which society recognizes as good must be the beneficiary of society's bigotries. That which society recognizes as evil, but must be the victim of society's bigotries. So it becomes their moral imperative to prove that good isn't good. It becomes their imperative to them to prove that evil isn't evil. And so what you'll see, for example, news is they will cover up Islamic acts of Islamic terrorism, because that's only going to reinforce your belief in the evils of Islamicism. And, and to jump at any opportunity to prove that America isn't good for, and, and the, just the example to my mind is uh, the ridiculous, over the top, incessant, uh, hy hyperbolic coverage of Abu Ghraib. All right, a handful of night guards at an obscure prison for terrorists badly misbehaved. And they turned that into a, a blot and a stain on America equivalent. Durbin compared them to the Nazis. Not that because our, there's that any... That was our old unit, by yeah. the way, Pete. Oh, was it really? That the 165th? Yes, yes. yes, it was. The mighty, mighty. Uh, sorry, guys. If I, <laughs> <laughs> sorry if that wasn't the best example to use. <laughs> hey, it's fine by me. I mean, I, you know, every unit has its thing. Um, I actually course. once stole in uh, in Bag not in Baghdad, up in Mosul, I stole a 165th painted bumper numbered Humvee, Eric, while I was up there. And it had names in the windows from people from the unit when we were all there. So that's, uh, that's wow. a, a funny... Well, a funny I, I, don't, I don't think you actually did anything wrong. I think you were just an undocumented owner. Well, and, and honestly, I just kind of borrowed it. And, and no. you know, it, that happens all the time. Of course. Of <laughs> lock, course. Your, lock your shit up <laughs> if you don't want someone to drive. <laughs> I gave it back within an hour or two. Uh, so l let me back out. Eric, when you hear him say all these things and during your guys' speech that you're all at, what are you hearing? Help us understand how this becomes an Intel analysis tool. Well, and, and again, part of it is, you know, you're, you're coming up with a definition of an ideology. And again, you, you have to start at the point where you're taking the ideology, whatever it is, and you're placing it as a, as a lens to view whatever the subject is. And so now in order to validate that, what you need then to do to, to develop you know, a predictive model, then you need to take a subject. And, and Evan's touched on a bunch of them already. And you have to say, all right, let's take a look at, oh gosh, the founding fathers, or let's take a look at Columbus Day, or you know, just as an as example. 
it's always around Columbus Day is when you start seeing, or, or even the 4th of July, about how our founding fathers were simply old white men who owned slaves that were looking out for their best interests. And they're, you know, and it just without being, you know, to try to just color the, the acknowledgement of what a unique opportunity that they set in motion or a unique chain of events that really defined what American exceptionalism is, that we were the only country in the world to go through a revolution, to change who our, our governing body from a person to a piece of paper and not have that revolution fall in on itself and devour itself. The French have tried it, the English have tried it, the Russians have tried it, everyone has tried it. And yet, so that is a, it's, you know, the American experience is such a unique thing. And that's where American exceptionalism comes from, like the core of it. But every time, you know, a holiday like this comes up, then you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing stuff. And I read, I go as far left as possible to take a look at just viewpoints, try to understand it. And every time I'm able to I get more and more predictive on just example, just, this is just one example, you know, on that given ideology. And, and so that, again, so it's like, if I can do predictive analysis on that, if I, if I already know what's going to be coming out from, and, and this is, uh, it's really not as much intelligence analysis. It's a, it, it's now you're looking at analysis of, information operations and that was one of the last jobs i had active duty and that involves psychological deceptions uh, thing you know the the media manipulation the, uh, the again they call it fake news what well, we've been doing it since forever you know I, I, that's just one particular subject where i know i'm going to see stories that are trying that are going to try to downplay the importance of the founding fathers the uh, specific writers of the constitution that downplay the importance of it and the Constitution is just a piece of paper, yada, yada, you know, that kind of thing. But then at the same time, because it, I was doing a counterterrorism analysis course, and this is why I took the, the ideology, I then took that and I applied it to different types of terror groups and how that ideology affected the method of operation of the terror group. And it wasn't just enough to say, oh, I'm going to start with Islamic fundamentalism. I went back and started doing uh, the, the the leftist Marxists of the of the 1970s, the national separatist groups like the the Bas separatists, and and you know even differences between the the 1970s PLO and associated groups with them, uh, uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or something like that. They were not really Islamic fundamentalist groups. Their ideology and their goals and the objectives and the motivations of the individuals that joined those terror groups are very much molded by that ideology. In the 1970s, you had your leftist groups, the, the Red the Red Brigade yeah. or the Bader Meinhof gang, or you had your Irish uh, Republican Army or the Provisional IRA. I mean, there's so many different terror groups. And every time I applied a model of using an ideology to help formulate the goals and motivations of, motivations of the individuals, but then the goals and objectives of the group, that it, it, I kept going, it kept going back to the things that Evan said and the, and the, and the different things that he put forth, that, that's how I developed that model. And, and so that's how we started using it for analysis. And it really became a way for me to, to focus in on something that I now call threat profiling. And I use that and, and I explain it in one of the chapters of my book of using threat profiling to understand a group using the different components, starting with motivations, goals, and objectives. Once you understand that on a group, everything else starts to make sense. How they recruit, how they pick their objectives and their targets, and how they're organized, their leadership, their, their sustainment, all of those things. And again, it's just and it's, again, it's one piece goes after another after another, but you have to logically walk the math through in order for it to make sense in an intelligence product or even if you're doing an, an information operations um, you know, a planning session or something like that. So when we look at today's Columbus Day, so we look at Columbus and uh, his legacy has always been in challenge, right? Like even when he right. was alive, a lot of people didn't take him all that seriously. And he wasn't the hero, I guess. Right. He, maybe he thought he should be. But nor was he the ultimate villain, the, the cause of the genocide that, uh, you know, that, that allowed the ethnic cleansing right. of the continent. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Let's be clear. Nearly every person who runs their mouth about Columbus 
has knows nothing about the person's life and has not in any way educated themselves. That's one of the keys to understanding the modern liberal is that they don't need to know anything because everything is preordained. They start with their conclusion, which is that every culture is equally good and equally right and equally valid. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. They start with their conclusion, which is that every culture is equally good and equally right and equally valid. Yeah. And then they cherry pick, spin, manipulate and invent whatever argument they need to uphold that preordained conclusion. They're simply not allowed to believe that the Jews, going back to my earlier of, of Israel, that the Jewish culture is a better culture than the Islamic one. So then how do you explain the, the, the poverty in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and, and the, the amazing prosperity of skyscrapers in Tel Aviv and Nobel Prize winning physicists and universities in Israel? There's two possibilities. One is that the, the Jewish culture is a superior culture to the Islamists and to the Islamics, or it isn't. And therefore, not only have the Jews oppressed and stolen from the Palestinians, but given the unprecedented success of, of the Israelis, it must be unprecedented oppression. Then they'll go back and they'll look through whatever few pieces of knowledge and information they may or may not have. And they'll keep looking down. They'll finally say, aha, it must be because the Jews built an extension on their house in, 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 in Jerusalem. Now, to an objective thinker, that's ludicrous. But to a modern liberal who's not allowed to think, it's the only possible explanation. In fact, any other explanation would make you a racist. So when I think about folks that aren't allowed to think, I definitely think of you know the conservative side of the spectrum, too. I mean, there are some very closed-minded, bigoted people. I was in Alabama, and I was going to grab a show. And I like to find shows that make me uncomfortable. And I was going to grab a show at the Jefferson Davis First White House. And I looked on the internet to kind of get a feel for what I was going to try to get myself into. And they were cutting a birthday cake for Jefferson Davis. And uh, Evan, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get my head wrapped around how you celebrate that dude's life. I I don't believe that that is a part of of the conservative right. I don't run into it myself. I certainly run into people who have strong religious beliefs. Uh, I certainly run into people of strong cultural, including patriotic beliefs. But as far as truly racist, I tend to run into them. But, you know, when when I when I first came up with my idea that that eventually became been talking about, I I turned to the only intellectual friend I had because everybody else I was, you know, was a Hollywood idiot. (laughs) You know, (laughs) it was a man who actually had worked for the Bush administration who I'd met through rather interesting and fun circumstances. But nonetheless, I sent it to him. And, and he said, this is absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, and it's something that has already been touched upon in, in this book that you need to read called The Closing of the American Mind. And the argument in The Closing of the American Mind is that the American mind has become so open-minded that it doesn't hold on to anything. And therefore, everything is prejudiced because it can't be changed by newly gathered facts. People who are prejudiced or, or, or even bigoted are not as bad as the people on the left because a bigot can have his mind changed. A bigot can, can, can be introduced to a new person, a new set of facts, a, a new line of reasoning, and perhaps change their mind. It's those who have no thoughts at all who are actually the most dangerous because when you have no thoughts at all, everything is prejudged and cannot be changed. They, they are the worst form of bigots or those who, have, who don't embrace any ideology. Yeah, it is frustrating. It seems to me that folks that are supposed to have the open minds and the tolerance often claim that their form of bigotry is better than than somebody else's. They're bad at history and perspective. You know, all of this one percenter talk. And listen, I want things to be good for as many people as possible. But if you're going to talk about one percenters, just back the camera up a little bit and look in at the U.S. (laughs) (laughs) You know, 
Well, I, you know, this is actually, and this is very much uh, central to the two next pieces. I'm writing one part of a bigger. My next piece is, is going to be a 50 page pamphlet because it's uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense was 50 pages. And I think we're about to have, if not a revolutionary war, then certainly a, a civil war. And the fight that we're fighting, what we call the culture war, is no different. The battle lines are no different than they were in World War II or in the Cold War. And that is global socialism versus national capitalism. Okay. And the, the, what, what, what uh, Marx called the bourgeoisie and what Hitler found more expedient to call simply the Jews is what today's socialists call the 1%. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of agreement there in my silence because, <laughs> yeah, we're awfully rough on those folks, again, without knowing anything about them. And do they play unfair? Okay, great. That, that's fine. We can have that conversation. May I, only because this is exactly as, just before I, I, I got on with you and the second I get off with you, this is, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm writing about. Let me hear it. The great evil, uh, every great evil, every atrocity, I'd even go as far as to say every injustice that, that government has ever committed against man has been because of a single ideology that I will call collectivism. Okay. Right? Collectivism, whether it is Islamicists who seek to globally rule the world uh, and, and those who embrace Islam are good and those who don't evil, whether it's Marxism, where it was one class would rule the world and members of that class, the working class were good and the members of the other class, the bourgeoisie were evil. Or it's it's collectivism and collectivism, or, or by the way, whether it was the national socialists who believed one race should rule the world, and if you were a member of that race, you were the master race, and yes. if you were you had the wrong bloodlines, you were not just wrong, you were evil, and so it's irrelevant to the collectivist whether the individual, how the individual got rich, or how Jewish is the Jew, etc. They are simply part; they are judged right or wrong by character traits. And that's, again, embraced by today's socialists. And just because all whites are privileged is the flip side of all whites are superior. Just because uh, men are toxic instead of women are hysterical. It's collectivism that is the evil and that allows them to not even care about how one individual behaved. Or if, if, if this is just because this individual deserves to be punished or deserve, whether he cheated for his money or whether he worked hard and then, and then raised philanthropist. The, 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 the individual acts, the specifics are unimportant to the collectivists. And you actually heard Nancy Pelosi say, she said, and if people disagree with us, get hurt by us, well, that's just collateral damage and so be it. And it's very telling, by the way, that the collectivists, like William Ayers, all right, the socialists, like William Ayers, he was a terrorist. Uh, the Islamicists are the terrorists. Why? Because terrorism is an act of collectivism. It's the collective punishment without due process or consideration about the individual. Eric, you're an expert in terrorism. How does that jive with you? Again, part of the, uh, the it's the same thing. Is is you you have to be able to you can't. You know, to be able to call somebody a terrorist, and, and, and Evans obviously very learned in this. It's like you just can't call somebody a terrorist. I, and I've seen this a lot in the news. Like, oh, this guy is doing terrorism. It's like, no. and, and every time it's like, oh, these guys don't understand what it is. And so, when you are modeling somebody, you have to apply the same standards to everyone. And that's why anything that that I have written so far, or anything in my book, I try to keep it as apolitical as possible because it just. It, I mean, Evan, this, this is his, this is his life. This is his work. I have, to, I look at this as a, as a learning experience, but then again, I have to be able to apply it to all sides. And so when, you know, when you are, are break down somebody that says, yeah, this guy was a terrorist, well, mostly it's because they're, they self-proclaimed it and right. said this was their goal. But then you have to look at what did the person do? Not, not what did somebody writing an article about them call them or something like somebody from the news organization is what was the, their intent? What was their goal and what did they do? And so when you look at and again, you get, you get these several of these uh, uh, groups that express the same frustration that you have, I guess, survivalist groups or folks on the, you want to say it on the, on the extreme right, which I really don't consider 
conservative. It's a different way of looking at it, but you have to apply the same model. And that's the problem, that I, and I run into that, and I have, I have had students left back and forth that came from different political bents and say, well, no, you're calling everybody that this person a terrorist because they're from this ideology. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this ideology follows these rules. If you adhere to these rules and these goals and motivations of objectives, then, and you, again, and you're okay with using violence to achieve a political aim to instill and to still fear as part of it, then yes, that's the definition. And there's several different definitions of terrorists out there, but this is the one we're going to use for this class. Well, Eric, would, would, would you agree what I just said, that collectivism, the idea that you can inflict collective punishment on the people who, who disagree with you, that terrorism is, is an act of collectivism. You, you have to embrace right. collectivism. Absolutely. In fact, embrace in fact, terrorism as a the, tactic. Yeah. In fact, the greatest, some of the, the terrorist writers that I've, that I know is that they terrorists in the past of what they said, this is before the rise of Islamic Fundamental 9-11, but they said, you know, terrorists don't want everybody dead. They want only a few people dead and they want, but they want everybody else watching that. Otherwise, right. I mean, there's the David the Trump, that, who was the, the intellectual I referred to earlier, uh, who was my one, one intellectual friend at the time, wrote a book on the 1970s, which is spectacular. I even referenced it uh, right back then in that original speech. And, right. and he, he's talking about what we were talking about earlier, all of the various environmental catastrophes that they threatened us with. Right. And he said it was very much like, like the Lord High Executioner in the Mikado, right. who said it, it really doesn't matter whose name I have on my list, just so long as I have a few names on my list. Right. Again, you can apply this to terrorism and you can also apply it to our political conversation right now uh, at the national level, especially. We just as I, as I wrote in my book, I talked a lot about how intelligence has left the intelligence community and now everyone is now practicing it. I mean, it's from corporations that need to do you know, corporate security, protect their executives, hide their secret sauce, that kind of thing. At the same time, though, is information operation has escaped military and escaped the government, and now that is being practiced by everyone to include political parties. And so, there, you know, the fake news is not something new. It's just a natural evolution of somebody who can plant a false story. Do a, you know, do we now have the problem of deep fakes? People faking videos of somebody talking or doing something on video that that's completely made up. All of this is now that we have that capability at our fingertips, we can spread the biggest lies and do the best deception. We can outdo what they did for Operation Fortitude to hide the entire D-Day landings at Normandy. There's a, you know, there's a small group in Washington that can do that by themselves now, and, and they're doing it on a daily basis. And so, but, but, but the problem is that, that it has expanded from... Uh, the news media being duped by somebody planting a fake story to the across the virtually across the board uh, uh, industry wide belief that telling fake stories is their moral responsibility. Right. You know, it's it's uh, right. how Howard's in when uh, you know the author of the single most described text on American American history said that objectivity is undesirable. That if you think that history should serve a social purpose, you make your choices based on that. Right. And that attitude right. has spread not just to the universities, it's the corporate policy, it's the ideological policy at every mainstream news outlet. It's something that William Burns said and, and proudly said he wasn't caught off, off uh, record or off camera. He said this in, a, in an interview for, for Attribution. That my research doesn't include gathering data and analyzing it. My research proselytizes. Uh -huh. Right, right. And, right. and the, that's yeah. That's the difference. Is is you, you know, at, you know, I I got you know tons of friends on Facebook. They keep asking me the same question. Is this, you know, what what is the news source that we can trust? And this is the 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 next uh, the next gal that I I've, I've hooked you up with, Pete, to to bring on your show. But the we've gone past the point where. The news is there to inform us, and I, I, it's now hard to find somebody who is not there to persuade us, and that has taken the place, and it's taken the place in our classrooms, it's taken the place on, in our entertainment, and, and so it's like we're, we're no longer having to 
critically analyze just the news. We have to analyze every single thing we now have come in contact with because every single format of mass media, whether it's entertainment, sports, academia, uh, everything, media, politics, everything. It, is, it is all you, changed. You can't, you can't even have a chicken sandwich without without uh, politics becoming involved. Exactly. In it. exactly. But I do offer in, in, in election, <laughs> in, in election, Except on Sunday. Form. Except on <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> lecture that I gave to the conservative forum, uh, forum of Silicon Valley, also available on my website, evansayit.com. Uh, I, I, I offer a partial uh, solutions the wrong, at least a, a, a way of getting better information, knowing who to trust. You know, news stories aren't just what day stories. They, they, play out over time. And the way that you can tell who you can trust or who you should trust is eventually what comes to be, comes to be. And how that correlates <laughs> to what they were predicting it would be earlier in the, in the, in the arc of the story is the way that, that, that you can, can know. I, I said that very poorly, but let me give you an example. When the, the Arab Spring was first breaking, Every leftist network was telling us how they were going to have a Jeffersonian democracy, finally the yoke of, of, of a, sometimes even American-supported dictators like Mubarak was overthrown, and now peace and love and understanding is going to come to the Middle East. And the people on Fox News are saying, well, what, there's a very good chance the Muslim Brotherhood might take over because uh, during revolutions, even in the best of, of attention, there, there's an opportunity, there's a vacuum, and the Muslim Brotherhood's the most powerful and organized to, to take over. Right? Well, they were called racists, and they were called Islamophobes, and they were trying to spread hate. But what, what came to be, came to be, the Muslim Brotherhood took over. Right? If you trusted uh, the New York Times for your news during the beginning of the Gulf War, the, reference, the, 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 the story I made reference to earlier, you thought that we were in a quagmire, that we pinned down, that, that it was hopeless, it was a bloodbath. When three weeks later, what came to be, came to be, Fox News was right and the others were wrong. And in fact, if you look out throughout all of these stories that I've been mentioning, Fox News may have made mistakes. Of course, all journalists make mistakes. So they, they might not have gotten the prediction exactly right. They might not have known it was going to be three weeks until our troops got there. But when our troops got to Baghdad three weeks later, if you watch CNN, you were stunned by reality. If you had trusted five, you were less surprised. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, and, and even in, even in today, uh, like let this, there's a, there's a great case uh, example of this, this Fox news poll that came out about uh, the impeachment of Donald Trump. And it came out last week and it said that 51% of Americans thought that Trump should be impeached uh, or, you know, impeached and removed from office. And, and, but when you go and, and I, I think say every time I see a poll like this, and this is again, this is why nobody can press polls anymore. Right. You, when you go into the, the poll itself, now you've got to dig into the 22 pages of demographics and everything they have in there. You find that they, the poll itself, this again, this is whoever Fox News contracted out to do this. It was 48 percent registered Democrats, 40 percent Republicans and only 12 percent independents is nowhere near the demographics of every every exit poll from the last election, which is more closely to 31, 28, and whatever's left over for independence. And so once you balance that out, you know, and so whoever they called, they just had, they just happened to have a response from uh, Democrats that were way over the rest, the other two for population. Well, well I've, I've, always, I've always wanted to be a, a professional presidential pollster because you only have to be right once every four years. <laughs> right. And you, right. And it, nobody and it, knows if you're right or wrong. Right. And then it has to be on the, the day before the election. because. And by the, the way, you also get a three point uh, uh, margin of error, which, by the way, is actually a six point margin of error. That's it's right. Six, six points. points. And only then 70 percent of the time. Well, yeah. <laughs> so again, so now every time when you look at a poll, you now have to you, you can't just say, oh, this is what the poll says. You now have to say. What, who is trying to persuade me with this result? And, and it's, and again, and, I, and I've, I've told my friends this several times, like nobody has time to do that for their daily read. Right. It's just, it is, it is too hard to sift through 
the garbage that you're receiving, whether it's through social media and which is the worst in terms of accuracy, but just through everything, yeah. you just don't have time to do that. And so that's why I was like, well, you just read your sources. Well, because I, 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 I have a series of sources that I trust, you know, more than others. But then I, every once in a while, you have to go off the reservation and see what's going on on the other side. Otherwise, it's, you're, you're just in an echo chamber. And that's, this, this poll was a great example of uh, the, the, you know, the even Fox thing. News, that, that's what are they trying to do to persuade me uh, on this piece? And the, and, and the other thing that, that you have to do is, is trust both common sense and your personal experience over what the experts are telling you. Right. Um, you know, if, if, if you everybody knows a hand, at least a handful of conservatives and uncle, somebody who's a conservative who's nice and lovely and isn't the fascist and isn't a Nazi and isn't Adolf Hitler. And, and so when the experts tell you that what he believes is, is, is evil, but you know him and he's not evil, you, you, you've got to give some weight to your personal experience over what it is those with an objective uh, have, have been trying to convince you of. You know, I think about... I a relative of mine, a, a, somebody who is very, very, very supportive of the left, mindlessly so, uh, and who, who changed along the way, who actually came over to, to, to my side, to, I'm going to say to our side. And what changed her was when she got the letter in the mail that said she could not keep her doctor, she could not keep her policy, uh -huh. oh, by the way, her premiums were skyrocketing. And it wasn't because she was selfish. It wasn't because, oh, now it's finally hitting me that I'm going to change my, my, my positions. It's because she didn't know what happened in, in Mexico, you know, fast and furious. She wasn't there. So she had to trust the media. She didn't know what happened in Benghazi. She wasn't there. So she had to trust the media. But when she when there was no media filter, when that letter came directly to her and she saw that Obama had been lying the whole time, that began her to think, and as I said earlier, the first time you think is the last time you're a Democrat. <laughs> and you know, Pete, what's 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 going to be interesting for you is is if, if we could get Vanessa Otero to come on, and she's the gal that that came up with the media bias chart, and she's a, a patent attorney out of Colorado. Yeah, I I honestly I I don't know her you know personally other than doing the same thing, reaching out here and doing contact and work with her on an article and, and have her chart in my book. Um, so you were I, cheating on me is what you're saying, Eric. <laughs> What's that? You were cheating on me. Well, e even worse. I was like, I, I don't, I think she is more of a, she is not a conservative. I think she's more of a centrist or even left of center. But again, it, it, it has to be able to work in terms of a methodology for both ways. I think you're going to be hearing the same things that Evan is saying. I think you're going to be echoed from her. And I'm just I'm making just a prediction and a guess or whatever. It's like somebody who is objectively looking at it and evaluating the news that we have to go through every day. It's just it's too much for the average viewer who average person who's got 10 minutes at most to look at their news and then drive on unless you're in the, the D.C. thought bubble. And, and, and a moment, uh, just, just the, an opportunity for a little bit of clarity about myself. I don't consider myself to be far on the right. I'm again, I'm actually a lowercase L uh, New York city born Hollywood right, Jew. Right, exactly. I'm just, I'm just virulently anti-leftist. <laughs> well, and I, I'm anti jumping to conclusions and, and acting like you're an expert. Like it's fine to listen to experts. Yeah. You want to talk about, you know, ground truth and, and what goes on. Then, then I, you can talk to me. I've done that a lot. Eric absolutely knows about analysis so but you guys, we're... you guys are experts due to actual experience. Yes. <laughs> and and, and oh. the problem, the problem is, in, in fact, my, my most famous comedy routine is entitled They Don't Do Anything. Yeah. And it's about all of right. the it's about all of the industries that we associate with liberalism, academia, journalism, entertainment and, and politics. Yes. And all of them are all talk, but no action. Right. All right. Every one of them, I mean, I'll, I'll just do, it's sort of like a who's on, uh, who's on first bit. So uh -huh. I can't a joke from it and go, what's on second and have it mean anything to you. It, it, it actually builds. But, you know, the job of the academic is for somebody who doesn't do anything 
to lecture to children who have yet to do anything about how evil the people who do things and did things were and the things that they did and they did. Right. Well, well this goes back to this I, whole thing with uh, Kurdistan and the president yeah. wanting to pull out. You know, he, first off, and I like to say this, politicians have no problem enriching themselves. So if there's some kind of secret deal, big deal, that's a norm. But right. the thing is, is as the commander in chief, he has to deal with these people that get torn apart in these conflicts an absolutely unmanageable part of the world right now. There's entirely too many things going on and cross interests. And so if he right. says, I'm going to get these guys out of the way while this, while this stuff goes on, he gets to. And then I did a show the other day with a guy named Kenton Stacy, And I, I should more accurately mm-hmm. say with Kenton's wife, because Kenton walked into a room in Syria and was blown up. He became a quadriplegic, blind in one eye, and lost his voice forever. So if we're cool with people staying in Kurdistan and we're mad at the president because he's trying to end a forever war or reduce it, then you've got to be cool with Kenton Stacy sitting there in his family. Four kids. Yeah. The oldest kid has cerebral palsy and he doesn't have constant like mental well-being care. So right. you got to be cool right. with that reality and that outcome and be like, yeah, that's cool. I, I'm, I'm happy that that's happening. The difference right. it can be seen in who supports socialism and who opposes it. Those who've lived in socialist and oppose it, whether it's the Cubans, right, or whether it, it, it's those who fled from the Soviet Union, the so, so, Soviet Socialist Republics, or those who are getting out of Venezuela, they oppose it. it it's yeah. the people who've never actually lived it, who have no experience, therefore no personal knowledge, who, who, who support socialism. Yeah. And one and, thing, we could say all politicians are a or, or, or certain way, but one of the telling differences between Republican politicians and Democratic Party politicians is Republican politicians tend to have made their fortune and then enter public service, whereas Democratic Party politicians tend to enter public service and then somehow make a fortune. Right? Barack Obama never had a job. Right? Nancy Pelosi never had a job. Chuck Schumer never. Joe Biden was first elected to the United States Senate while he was still in his 20s, and he's going to be a politician till the day he dies. Compare and contrast whatever you think of Donald Trump. The man didn't enter politics until he was 70. He was too busy building buildings. John McCain didn't enter politics until after a career in the military. Mitt Romney didn't enter politics until a career as a businessman. So these people had experience and then became uh, public servants, as opposed to the Democrats who right out of school begin to try to tell you how you should live, what you should eat, what you can drink, what size straw you can use, what size uh, soda you can drink, that you can't have meat, that, you can't, that they, without any real world experience, there's a great story about uh, one of the most iconic and perhaps the first real modern liberal presidential candidate, George McGovern. And after a lifetime of doing nothing, he lectured as an academic and then segued into politics where he speechified. And, and at the end of his career, after he'd lost to, to Richard Nixon in 72, he retired and decided to pursue his lifelong goal, a lifelong bucket list thing, where he was going to open a small business, an inn. I, I, I don't, don't remember if it was Massachusetts. That would make sense, though. But, and he was out of business within a year and a half. And he said, quote, how can anybody run a business with all these regulations? Yeah. Did you not know that when you were the one putting in all those regulations? Right. Because he didn't know how his policies affected real life. Oh, man. Listen, I've had you for an hour and I don't want to abuse your time. I know you could keep going. And Eric and I aren't even able to. You're like, I, I'm trying to talk. You're trying to. It's so good, man. Really, I really appreciate you coming on. That's what I'm trying to say is these kind of conversations where we can have reasoned talk and and, and look at a side of a, of a story. You know, that's. That's real. And just throwing around accusations and, and intolerance, that's that's what I want to try to avoid. And that's why I appreciate Eric for bringing you on and, and you to be out there uh, putting these things together because we do need to get better at mapping this. And I can't read all the news. And as much as I'd like to try to read all of the Supreme Court decisions, I can't read them all and don't always understand them when I do. Pete, let me, let me save you some time. Just read Apocalypse Now and the Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks. I will. I will do that. And we'll put those links on the show for everybody. If you guys buy those books, make sure you rate them 
review them five stars that helps out that helps get evan out there doing more of this thing because clearly look he's a smart guy he's really thought about a lot of things and uh, i want to support what he's doing and we're going to have you back on evan as soon as you uh as soon as you're locked and loaded and ready to go again let's have you on and do another one of these anytime it was absolutely my pleasure thank you gentlemen thank you and thank you eric thank you pete appreciate it